Hi everyone, it's Ms. Sheehan, and today I'm going to do a video on um, uh, a couple of different phases of uh, the French Revolution. So I call these kind of the moderate to radical phases. So this is post tennis court oath, and then we go through all the way through a guy named Robespierre. So this is not certainly all the revolution, just uh, highlighting a couple of the different governments. Okay. All right, so we talked about the tennis court oath, we talked about the Estates General, right? You read about the storming of Bastille and the Women's March. So at that point, after the Women's March in 1789, King Louis XVI is taken from his palace at Versailles, and remember Versailles is about 20 miles away from Paris, and he's brought to Paris basically to kind of be under the control of the revolutionaries. And at this point, the king, Louis the 16th realizes that to stay king and maybe even to stay alive, he needs to kind of submit to the demands of the third estate representatives and the revolutionaries. So uh, in 1789, the third estate representatives, those men who had taken the tennis court oath, form what they call a national assembly. So that's our first kind of government, and I put that in quotes because the National Assembly is not really a government, but it's the first government of the French Revolution. So the National Assembly first passes what's a basically kind of a constitution, and they call it the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. And we'll look a little bit more at it in depth next time. But basically it lays out all the rights that French citizens should have, including Things like freedom of speech, the right to own your own property, freedom of religion, etc. Um, the motto at this point that the revolutionaries come up with is liberté, equalité, fraternité, which means uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Fraternity means like brotherhood, and that continues to be really the, the rallying cry and motto of the revolution. Uh, they also at this point reform the church. So if you remember from uh, last week, right, uh, the church, the first estate, really owned a, a lot of land and they also had a lot of money. So the National Assembly takes over church lands. They actually change the structure of the Catholic Church in France so that priests are elected. Priests had a lot of power. Um, and they also made the church give France a lot of money. However, this kind of backfired a little bit on the National Assembly because um, it upset um, a lot of the peasants who were very strongly religious and thought that the church should continue to be controlled by um, the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, uh, rather than by the government of France. But again, it was this attempt, an attempt at like evening out kind of the power of the two estates as compared to the, the third estate. Okay. So by 1791, the National Assembly had really taken over a lot of the king's power. And at this point, their rumors reached them that the royal family's lives, the king, the queen, Marie Antoinette, um, and their children's lives could be in danger, right? So they get in a carriage and basically try to escape to the border of France, what were the Austrian Netherlands at that time. Um, and they almost make it actually, but they are caught near the border and return to Paris. And this is kind of the first signal that the um, nobility and the royals maybe are not going to go along with the revolution. So at this point, tension kind of knocks up. And Right after this, the National Assembly decides to finally complete their constitution and form a new government. So in 1791, they get Louis to kind of reluctantly approve it, and they create a government called the Legislative Assembly. And yes, all the governments have names that sound very similar. We can thank France for that. Um, but so this is the second kind of government of the revolution, the Legislative Assembly. Um, so it's a constitutional monarchy, which means that Louis the 16th is still king. He still gets to enforce the laws, but now there's a um, parliamentary or congressional body that um, so the Legislative Assembly is the representatives and they have the ability to create laws and declare war. So this is really kind of modeled on um, you know, almost what would become our constitution where we have the Congress and the president, right? And so they are now, as I said, a constitutional monarchy.
Okay, so at this point, the rest of Europe gets kind of nervous, right? And a lot of Europe at this time was still ruled by monarchs, right? Some of them were enlightened, but they're still monarchs. Um, and they are getting concerned about what's going on in France. So the Prussians and the Austrians actually openly support the restoration of Louis the 16th to absolute monarchy. And essentially they declare war on revolutionary France. So the Legislative Assembly takes action and they declare war in 1792. So not only are they trying to set up a brand new government at home in France, but they're also fighting with two major European powers at this point. Um, so it's pretty chaotic. And France is now at war with Prussia and Austria. And Prussia, just so you know, would later become, um, it's, it's now part of Germany, right? So it's kind of in that uh, Northern European area. Okay, so the Prussian army actually invades France and they advance towards Paris, the capital. Um, and they in fact threaten to destroy Paris if the king is not returned to the throne, if um, he does not get all of his power back. Um, this tactic backfires on the Prussians and in fact a mob of, of revolutionaries invade the royal palace and they take Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette and their children into custody and put them in prison. So at this point the king is not really a king because you can't be a king from prison, right? Um, and so that does not go well for the Prussians. Uh, French troops can focus on fighting off the Prussians and pushing them out of France. Um, and Paris is really left in the hands of the citizens, right? There are some, uh, probably maybe a thousand supporters of the king who are imprisoned in Paris. These are called royalists, right? So people who didn't support the revolution and wanted the king to go back to like the old ways, right? And rumors go around that these supporters are going to break out and take control while the French military is away fighting the Prussians and kind of try and end the revolution. So in September of 1792, citizens, uh, revolutionary citizens actually raid the prisons in Paris and slaughter over a thousand prisoners, basically as an attempt to try and stop a counter revolution from happening, to try and stop them from being able to get out and restore Louis to the throne. Um, and royalists, priests, and nobles um, from the first and second estate are all among those killed or hurt. And so at this point, it's pretty clear that the Legislative Assembly is not working, right? The king is in power, they're in a war, mobs are breaking out in Paris, right? Something needs to be done. So it's time for another new government. So the Legislative Assembly is under pressure. They officially depose the king, which means he is officially no longer king, right? So France is no longer a monarchy. They dissolve the Legislative Assembly and they call for a new government. The new government is called the National Convention. And at this point, all men get the right to vote. And France is now a democracy. So it actually takes three governments and several years of revolution for France to get from an absolute monarchy to a democracy. Right? So, so far we've had the Legislative Assembly, or we've had the National Assembly, which is the tennis court oath representatives, the Legislative Assembly, uh, which was the constitutional monarchy, and now we have the National Convention, which is the democracy. And at this point, they decide having Louis alive, uh, Louis XVI alive, is too dangerous. Someone like the Prussians or like the Royalists could come and you know, try and take over the government and put him back on the throne. So they decide the only thing to do is execute him. So he is actually stripped of his titles as a noble and a royal. He is tried as a citizen of France in a court, and he is sentenced to death. Um, and he is beheaded by the guillotine, right? And the guillotine is that, you know, it, the chopper. <laughs> Um, it chops off people's head with a very sharp blade. And that really kind of became a symbol of the French Revolution. And so there's a painting um, of Louis being beheaded by the guillotine in front of a crowd. <laughs> 
right? And so at this point, this, I always identify this, the execution of Louis the 16th as the moment that the revolution turns from a more moderate revolution to radical, right? This is radical. They have killed their king. Even the Americans didn't do that, right? They've killed the king. The monarchy is dead. So at this point, a man named Maximilien Robespierre comes to power. The National Convention actually established a committee um, that would become an executive branch, so kind of like um, a committee of presidents, kind of, um, and they called it the Committee for Public Safety. And the Committee for Public Safety is um, led by this guy, Maximilien Robespierre. And eventually, over a few years, he basically becomes a dictator. So the National Convention really kind of stops functioning as a democracy, and Robespierre becomes essentially the dictator of France. So we've gone from a constitutional monarchy to a democracy to a dictatorship. And at this point, Robespierre institutes something called the Reign of Terror. Um, so his committee, the Committee of Public Safety, goes after anyone who disagrees with the revolution, right? Um, and not just the revolution, but their version of the revolution, right? Um, and this era really becomes known as the Reign of Terror because essentially their solution to anyone who disagrees with their version of the revolution is to execute them. And they execute them primarily using the guillotine. Thousands of people are tried and executed during this about a year period. Um, it's possible up to 40 or 50,000 people are executed by a guillotine. Um, even sometimes supporters of the revolution were victims if they didn't support Robespierre's particular policies. And actually people who had been like part of the tennis court oath and had been instrumental in the convention and the legislative assembly were in fact executed by the Committee of Public Safety and Robespierre. Okay, so we'll stop there. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll talk to you later.